or it's a net networking mixer. Um, you know, we hold these periodically, I believe monthly. Uh, for those of you who don't know, TIE, TIE is an organization to really foster entrepreneurship, provide different educational uh, uh, content and support, uh, uh, network with, you know, other like-minded individuals, folks who've been, uh, you know, previously built out companies, successful, uh, as well as, you know, fellow entrepreneurs, et cetera. So we do a variety of programs uh, around uh, the whole theme of entrepreneurship and supporting entrepreneurs. Uh, typically, these programs sometimes had been physical, obviously, with COVID, uh, we have changed the format and now doing more uh, virtual events. Uh, so appreciate everybody dialing in. Um, and, uh, you know, we have a, uh, a strong panel today on the topic uh, that uh, we're going to be discussing. Again, the idea is to really, uh, you know, take a topic, um, share some thoughts and ideas from a variety of perspectives, uh, have you folks, you know, ask questions. So it's really a, you know, um, interactive session from that perspective. Uh, the way we are going to run that is we're going to run the panel initially with some particular topics for the first half an hour or so in discussion. Um, if you have questions, please do use the, you know, chat box both to ask questions as well as you know, uh, interact with folks. Uh, so that it can be more, uh, you know, interesting and interactive in a virtual format. Uh, and then later on, we'll open up some smaller sessions, depending on how many people there are, uh, so that you can have more one-on-one -on -one interaction with the panelists, get to know each other and other participants here as well. Uh, before we jump in, let me uh, first introduce myself and introduce uh, the panelists. So I'm Kamal Anand. I'm one of the Thai, uh, you know, folks associated with Thai on the Thai board. Uh, I've been a serial entrepreneur. So... Uh, the topic today really is about uh, finance and accounting, which I'm sure many of you do not find exciting, <laughs> uh, but it's a very important um, aspect of thinking about building the processes, the pool, you know, the uh, uh, building the right processes in the company. So as you scale up, uh, it becomes quite important as you either look at an exit, if somebody comes in, if you raise your next round of financing or you want to go public, having the right things uh, being done at the right time in the company becomes uh, rather important. Um, many tech entrepreneurs obviously, you know, may not have background in that, may not focus on that in the early stage of the company. So the idea was to, uh, you know, explain some of these concepts, what uh, some of the panelists think is the right uh, uh, topics to think about as you uh, look at finance and accounting functions in the company. And we're going to talk about pre and post, uh, sorry, uh, uh, in two stages, sort of the pre uh, pre-revenue type of companies, very early stage, what are the top, you know, people, processes, tools you should be thinking about uh, and once you have revenue, uh, some of the dynamics change and what you should be thinking about. So, you know, from my perspective, given I have been an entrepreneur a few times, uh, I will bring that kind of thought process in uh, as a entrepreneur that, you know, uh, looked at this, struggled with this or executed that. Uh, but more importantly, we have a very strong panelist that will bring different uh, perspectives. So firstly, we have Amar Bhatkande. He's an audit partner at the Eisner Ampner firm, but I will let all the folks introduce themselves later. But uh, Eisner Ampner is one of a large organization, about 2,000 partners that do a variety of you know advisory and consulting services. Um, we have Omesh Sharma, who will bring kind of the real CFO experience. He's taken uh, he's currently CFO at Mind Valley, but has been CFO of public companies, has taken companies public, and uh, also been part of private companies. So again, a different perspective as the CFO uh, experience. And then Shivani Sapori, uh, who is uh, a venture capital partner at KPMG, uh, again, uh, in the audit practice, uh, KPMG, for those of you who don't know, is obviously one of the big four. I think there are four now, if not the big three, I don't know. The industry keeps getting consolidated, but uh, uh, one of the big uh, you know, firms in, in the industry around uh, you know, audit, consulting services, et cetera. So we are very fortunate to have all three sort of participate and share their views. Uh, thank you very much, Omesh, Amar, and Shivani. But before we jump in, why don't you, you know, introduce yourselves a little bit and uh, give, uh, you know, some experience uh, that you have in this particular topic. So, well, uh, why don't we start with uh, Umesh? We'll put, put you on the spot. Sure, not a problem. Uh, it's a pleasure. And thank you, Ty, for bringing us over here and uh, fortunate to be here. Um, I've been a CFO for uh, more than 30 years. Uh, um, I have been associated with more than uh, 50 startups, uh, done... Uh, plenty of m as and uh, as uh, Kamal said, have taken the company private as well as taken the company public. So I've done both uh, the aspects of uh, public uh, company perspective. Currently, I'm engaged with uh, a tech company. Um, 
and uh, we are looking to go public. Um, I'm also a uh, investment bank advisor uh, to um, Australian Bank, uh, and uh, we are the, a lot of the U.S. technology companies, rather than going for the CDC, try to go public. So if you're not a unicorn and you are between 30 million to 100 million, think of Australian stock chain, which is the third largest capital in the world uh, and gives better liquidity. So I do uh, that too. Thanks, uh, thanks, Omar, Omish, and um, Shivani. Why don't you give us some little background and perspective? Sure. Uh, thank you again for having me, and Ty, thank you for hosting this as well. I think it's a great topic. So uh, my name is Shivani Sapori. I am, like Kamal said, an audit partner at KPMG. I also run what we call our private enterprise group in Silicon Valley. So my main focus is working with companies that are um, early stage through their IPO and then usually a couple of years thereafter. Uh, so I've been working with a bunch of tech startups in the Bay Area for probably the last 10 to 15 years um, and hoping to share some knowledge with the group. Thanks, uh, Shivani and Amar. Last but not least, maybe you can share some of your you know, experience in this particular area. Thanks, Kamal, and thanks, Shivani. That was a great introduction, Omesh, as well. Uh, Amar Bhatkande, I'm an audit partner at, and a West Coast you know, tech and life sciences leader for Eisner Amper. Uh, been with uh, Eisner for 18 and a half years, first on the uh, East Coast, spent 12 years on the head, uh, head offices in New York. I actually came here, I think, uh, can't believe it's more than five years now, back in 2016, to lead our tech and life sciences practice. So here I am, uh, excited to be part of this. Thanks, Amar. And uh, for everybody, just to reiterate, you know, we'll kind of structure the discussion and, you know, into two um, segments, maybe. First segment is really about pre-revenue companies, and then talk about, you know, what's different as you scale up revenue and in terms of people, processes, and tools. So why don't I kick it off, Amar, maybe uh, you can talk about, right, if you're a pre sort of revenue early stage company, you know, what's important, you know, for, you know, there's a lot of people, you know, our tech entrepreneurs obviously here have not probably handled finance, don't think about accounting, don't think that is sort of as important, <laughs> you know, they're focused on building the product or uh, have deep experience in that. And so I think any guidance around what is important at that stage in terms of, you know, simple processes to implement, uh, what kind of people or, you know, consultants to engage with, uh, what kind of tools, what's your perspective uh, on that? Thanks, Kamal. I think, I think great question. I'll start with first things first, right? Uh, let build product and sell product has to be the basis of it. If, if there is no product, there is no accounts, no finance, right? So let's get that out of the way. Yes, that should be the focus, right? But having said that, I think you rightly pointed out that a lot of you know uh, founders are not used to account financing because they come from an engineering background or whatever backgrounds they come from, right? So uh, in my mind, I think uh, the biggest thing what a uh, founder or the new startups should be focusing on is having a good sense and a good hold on the cash, right? Cash flows, right? If you can manage your cash flows right, for the most part, you're going to get it right. Right. So, so typically what I'll, I'll, I'll recommend is have a spreadsheet, uh, you know, you have your uses of you know, uh, your sources and the uses of cash and, you know, track it by that. And then a couple of other things that, you know, I also recommend is, you know, if, if you get into a little bit understanding of the income statements and the balance sheet, it doesn't have to be very fancy. It's just on, on a spreadsheet, you do tabs and, you know, track it that way. And then I think once you have that laid out, right, I think one of the critical aspects for me is the projections, right? So if, if you are now building and selling a product, have a, a really robust projections, right? So with, with assumptions, you know, listed out saying, for example, my first, the first year I'm going to do X dollars. Next year I'm going to target, or here's my target. So that is your assumption. So lay out those assumptions very clearly right at the onset. And then you can start tracking against your projections and assumptions, how you're doing, right? And start tracking the key metrics. When I say key metrics, I always say number of customers, you know, month on month increase in sales, uh, uh, cost of acquisition, acquisition cost, customer acquisition cost, stuff like that. Lay out the basic uh, key metrics and again, start tracking those. And last but not the least, I'll say uh, cap tables. Cap tables are extremely important. A lot of times what happens is you're working with your friends, family, and I said, all right, I'll get, get you 100,000 options or shares, right? 
start tracking those because if if and when the company becomes big and then you you are starting to think about you know outside funding those all come in handy if you have 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 it tracked if you haven't there's always a chance that something comes up later on so start tracking it and that that would be you know the basic set of financials which would i would expect you know um shivani omesh you know feel free to add yeah i think you, Am amar you made a you know good set of points again i think it's uh, in in the initial stage from my perspective as an entrepreneur it, you know uh, you know you, you can do fairly simple things but i think it's important to put something on paper because once you start putting the numbers you realize you know either the numbers are off or you it forces you to think you know uh, you know where do you where, what kind of cash do you need what kind of expenses do you foresee uh, and what you know all that kind of stuff so i think it's just a forcing function for you to think about as a you know Absolutely. entrepreneur um but uh, you know as a cfo may yeah. sure I, i don't i don't think you know you need a cfo at that stage no. but maybe you can add to what amar said as well as you know if, no, if i don't uh, know if i'm an entrepreneur i'm a tech guy i don't even know what a balance sheet or income statement is yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. engage a cfo or you know what do i do right to help somebody help me what should i be doing uh, and at what stage would be helpful for i can share you a couple of experiences over here i've been in a company where uh, when i walked in it's a company of five people uh, three of them founders and i was given a uh, the card box uh, and where they had randomly thrown all the receipts that this is what all our accounting is uh, you know go do your magic uh, we we keep track of the cash in the bank but any receipts what we have we just throw it over there um so i i'll say that that's predominantly in a lot of the startup world people uh, do take care of the cash they are aware that they have to keep the receipts in the backup and they'll just have a brown bag or a box keep on throwing over there and then they wait uh, you don't need a cfo but definitely a bookkeeper i think is not a bad idea and that can be a contracted so that you don't have a full time cost um in two companies where i was uh, the technology was so strong that the uh, the acquisitions happened within the first year so in that kind of a scenario i think they bought me in but a lot of the time i think i ended up spending because there was no agreements even the cap table that sacra uh, was not there uh, there were agreements on the uh, the offer letters but nothing was done as well as when they bought in the consultants they didn't have any of the uh, ip related uh, signatures and in a technology firms those are the must and i remember going uh, to stanford uh, and knocking on the people's dorms because a lot of the people came from there to get the signature uh, that was a couple of years ago so i'll say the agreements even if you don't have the bookkeeper or the thing keep the backup uh, you know watching the cash is the most important thing which uh, a lot of the founders are savvy enough that you they do watch what is in the bank uh, at the early stage if uh, nothing else i think bookkeeper is not a bad idea pre ipo uh, pre revenue companies i think that can take care of a lot of things and depending on the board and the board requirements and uh, what's the size of the company pre revenue if uh, there's a lot of the headcount may not be a bad idea to bring in the consulting cfo yeah definitely don't need the full time guys at that stage yeah, yeah I, mean, i i'm glad you mentioned payroll because or headcount because i think that's the number one thing like you definitely want to make sure you're taking care of your employees yeah. so make sure you um have the appropriate employment agreements in place if you've got people in different countries make sure you have the appropriate um you know legal setups in your country to be able to support the employees and uh there are a lot of different companies that um have relatively low cost options for employing payroll at your um at a smaller entity so definitely look at some of those options um to make sure that you're at least getting your paychecks to your employees on an ongoing and regular basis yeah and a lot of people at that stage because uh, they're not offering the lot the be- health benefits and below 5 you're not going to get any po companies but your companies like gusto adp are very low cost uh, i strongly suggest those and if you get to the benefit stage and you're more than 5 i think po may, may not be a bad idea because then you don't have to worry about uh, which state i'm hiring am i able to give them the right kind of benefits and benefits believe it or not is a major uh, decision making factor for the uh, talent to get on board a lot of people look at it more uh, on the healthcare benefits than the salary 
Yeah, I think this is a good segue to kind of, you know, uh, because I think about, you know, what are the people, process and tools. Uh, and I think in today's world, the tools have become, uh, uh, you know, fairly robust and easy to use, even if you're a non-financial person, at least for the basic stuff. Uh, and secondly, most of the people have some kind of freemium model. So you're not even spending a lot of money to just make sure you have some, you know, some uh, controls and tools. Uh, but any particular recommendations, maybe uh, Shivani, from your perspective, what you're seeing companies implement these days? Again, we don't want to pitch a particular, um, uh, you know, uh, a tool, but I will, you know, share my experience, what kinds of things I use, but would love to hear from all of you, you know, what's important at a pre-revenue kind of, you know, stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, not um, pitching any specific company, but what I typically end up seeing is companies utilize, um, you know, online services like a QuickBooks online. Um, that's typically what I end up seeing for my earlier stage companies. There are a lot of entities out there right now that also provide you bookkeeping and consult like tax consulting services as part of uh, like an online package, something like an Indonero or like a Zero. Uh, so there are options out there for people that, um, you know, don't maybe want to hire a full-time bookkeeper, but want some additional assistance as they're working through their processes. Omesh, any other, uh, you mentioned, you know, the HR kind of stuff, but any other besides QuickBooks? Yeah, no, I think for the, uh, for the accounting, zero QuickBooks, QuickBooks is a definitely uh, predominant. Uh, and if you have the India subsidiaries, uh, they also are using QuickBooks and they have an Indian tool also. I'm forgetting the name top of my head. So those are quite common uh, and easy to use. Um, you can take a desktop version too, uh, you know, if you don't want to have the monthly uh, fees. And for payroll, et cetera, I think the easy ones are Gusto, ADP services. If you're not a PEO, if you go to PEO, then you have what wanted, just works, uh, you know, Trinet. Uh, these are the major names, but uh, uh, I always look at it, you know, that one has to be very careful when you're looking at the things because majority of these companies, you have to really know what where to squeeze uh, because it's possible when people look at it, PEO, I think that I can tell you the example that they look at it, what is the processing cost of the employee and uh, they don't go for it because these companies will charge you somewhere around $100 per month, depending on if you're below 10, whereas on Gusto, the whole payroll can be $50 or less. But uh, I think the real key is if you're going with the broker model of the healthcare, that can be huge. So you have to look at it overall cost when you're comparing it, just don't compare. Here's the processing fees with one company to another. Look at what is the overall cost and uh, make the decision what is the right for you. So I'll, uh, I'll suggest that. And then, you know, cap table men meant you have uh, Carta's there, ShareWorks is there, uh, rather than spending a lot of the money with the lawyers. Uh, I think uh, that's not a bad idea to implement in the beginning. Uh, and plus you're gonna get the 409 evaluation free. If you're going on your own, I think the cheapest one, even at that stage uh, runs around $3,000. So, and you can get Carta for like four, three, 3,500. I've done the deals to 5,000 in the beginning years. So if you take care of the 409A and lawyer's cost of the cap table management, I think it works out to be pretty economical as well as um, you have the process where people can access it in a much more uh, timely manner. Yes, you know, I'll give you my experience because I went through this you know, recently in one of my companies and we were pre-revenue, in fact, pre-payroll because the founders didn't pay each other, you know, we didn't pay ourselves. <laughs> Um, uh, and so some of these things didn't apply, uh, like, you know, we didn't have a payroll initially, but, you know, things like QuickBooks and Zero are pretty, very easy to use, even if you're a, you know, non, uh, non-finance person, but having some tools, in my opinion, is important. Um, secondly, uh, you know, from a payroll perspective, I agree with you, Amish, you know, I, I've seen the PEO companies, but those become relevant, like ADP or Trinet or others, slightly at a later stage, uh, right. when you have, you know, more than five, 10 employees and you have right. scale. Uh, however, with especially with remote working today, you know, you are you will tend to have maybe employees or consultants in different parts of the U.S. even, uh, and so having something like a Gusto or another company that can process in these different states is important. Especially if you do payroll, if you're not doing payroll, then for that time period it doesn't matter. But uh, but frankly, you know, things like Gusto and others have become very easy and low cost, as Umesh you mentioned. So you know, don't shy away from it, right? Don't try to save that fifty dollars. Is my my opinion, because that firstly, you end up spending more time initially, and then with compliance and, 
you know, following up with paperwork with EDD and other people, you know, that becomes, you know, complex itself. So don't be sort of uh, save that 50 bucks, you know, per month, you know, spend it somewhere and focus on building the product is my, you know, advice and counsel on that, uh, you know, side. Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, I got reminded about your uh, receipt. So in one of my previous companies long time ago, uh, we actually went public with that. But one of the co-founders for probably six, seven years, I won't name him, he was putting all his personal expense receipts in a box. And when we went public, obviously, we wanted to clear all that stuff up. And it turned out he had like his own personal expenses were like more than $150,000 that he had not claimed from the company. Obviously, he didn't tell his wife or something, but, you know, he had spent the money. But, you know, it's important to periodically either at least know what you have spent, even if you have not charged to the company or to charge it periodically, uh, because it might become an issue later on, either for you or for the company. And if you get an acquisition offer or you're going public and you haven't done all this stuff, then, it, you know, you have to catch up on that. But um, any particular things we want to add, Amar, to this? I know. Yeah, no, I think the, I, you guys covered most part of it. My only recommendation always to my clients is that, you know, if, don't keep it, keep the function in-house because I think these days you can easily hire someone who will put you on a stack, typically to QBOL or, you know, zero and then all those, you know, and Gusto. And it comes at fairly uh, reasonable prices. So just, you know, if you focus on your business, give everything else to others and uh, you can easily manage it. That's a much better way of managing it. And I'll go to an extent saying, don't bring it in-house till you really have to bring it in-house. At some point, there's always an infection point wherein you have to bring it back, right? But till then, just uh, do yourself a favor, focus on your core competencies and your, your business. That's all. Yeah, I completely I'll add agree. a story to that over here. I was the first advisor uh, when Gusto started working and uh, there were Y Combinator. Uh, there were the Stanford and there were the roommates with uh, one of my CEOs whose company I had sold. And at that time I thought, you know, that payroll is so simple at that time, ADP paychecks were dominant players. Where is this company going to go? And Gusto has proved everyone to be wrong. So I think that the point I was trying to make is keep the thing simple, outsource, utilize it. These companies came out of nowhere a couple of years ago when all these dominant players were there. But because of their simplicity, easy to implement, they have taken the market share. Uh, so I'll just add to that. Yeah, absolutely. I think everybody's making this point that I think you have to decide you know, where you want to focus your kind of precious time as an entrepreneur and and where you want to outsource. And uh, I personally have a, you know, strong accounting background as well. I have an MBA and all that. And I enjoy actually doing that. I'm one of those guys. That, <laughs> uh, but even then you want to, you know, I've, I've found people that you outsource all the, you know, the actual, you know, legwork, bookkeeping, all that to somebody and you're kind of giving the oversight. Uh, and to I think a bunch of you have made this point that today fairly low cost services are available. Uh, I'm not recommending KPMG or uh, one of the big firms here, but uh, you know, at the early stage, you don't really need those high profile, you know, firms, you, you might need that at a later stage. Uh, and, you know, frankly, you can outsource this. I've, you know, always used companies in India that, uh, you know, effectively do the bookkeeping for you at very, very low cost. So it's not really an issue. You do need some oversight around as you start getting revenue and we'll talk about it uh, around, uh, uh, you know, thinking about kind of the US accounting rules, etc. cetera. Uh, but you can, uh, uh, you know, with very low cost, you, you can build a process and you know infrastructure that is you know reasonable at that stage. Uh, um, so wonderful. Why don't we you know take a transition? Um, actually, I'll make one last point as an entrepreneur. Uh, Omesh, you made this point. I think a lot of us actually shy away from uh, getting some of the paperwork done. So I think the lawyers, in terms of you know IP assignment of your employees and consultants, those become very important. And I you know although I've done four or five companies, even the last company I sold, even I realized that you know I had missed up on two or three of these folks over time, and so when the acquisition you know process goes, uh, you have to go chase all those people and get those paperwork signed, uh, making sure. So I think uh, uh, making sure you have some kind of IP assignment in your offer letter, consulting agreements, and uh, you not only get people to sign that, but you keep it in a repository that you know easily accessible later on is becomes actually quite important and saves you a lot of headache down the road. Um, so, I, uh, again, you know, uh, either you can invest with some lawyers or so a lot of these documents are available online today. You can do some Google searches and find those resources. A lot of the law, law firms provide these sort of free uh, on their websites and things like that. So with a very low cost infrastructure, you can actually, 
build a pretty nice um, uh, you know set of uh, processes and and uh, uh, and documentation that is needed. But why don't we switch gears? I think when revenue starts coming in, I think the game changes a little bit. Um, um, uh, uh, you know, in terms of these things. And so maybe um, um, one of you, whoever wants to jump in, uh, you know, talk about what changes when you have revenue, what kind of processes, people, tools you want to do. Uh, maybe Amari, again, uh, if you want to start uh, as an auditor uh, and, and experience in helping these companies. That uh, Sure. I mean, um, yeah, so so it's, it's very, yeah, thanks. And so it's, it's very interesting, you know, uh, so when I said that, you know, uh, one of the reasons I typically said that, you know, hey, keep the accounting function outsourced. The reason behind that is that even if you're in the startup mode or, you know, you started, started to generate a revenue, you're always thinking, what's my next step, right? And from, it's, it's a preparatory step towards that saying, okay, I'm gearing up now for outside financing. Right. So once you start thinking about outside financing, uh, clearly, I think you need a little bit better sets of cards. Uh, so that's one of the things that I always recommend is when you choose an outside, you know, say cloud accounting firm that you're going to work with, do your homework, make sure that those guys have a little bit of knowledge, right? Just don't go, somebody's offering you 50 bucks, just don't take it. I understand your, your future needs a little bit better. Right. I mean, look, you said, yes, there are tons of firms back in India. So does everybody, you know, big four and us and everybody has, you know, our India firms and we can do understand that, you know, when you take the next step, is that firm going to be able to help you? Right. Because you actually at that point, you really need the financial sets, right? The balance sheet, a proper PNL, because if you want to walk to someone saying, hey, I need X dollars of financing, they're going to say first say, OK, what do you have? Show me your records. Right. So that becomes extremely important. Uh, at that point, I always say, you know, uh, getting ready uh, with, with a robust set of, you know, uh, a balance sheet, income statements, uh, statement of changes, budgets becomes very important. Uh, one other thing is, I think I talked about forecasting, right? The forecasting starts getting sophisticated. People are going to look for, towards you saying, hey, all right, is there your, your work, whatever you're doing, is it disruptive enough? How, how much can you, you know, how much sophisticated for, can you forecast out, right? All those things become very important at that point, especially when uh, VCs, VCs start playing a pivotal role in it. So to me, uh, it, it's just a transition extension of where you start started and you just keep, you know, growing into that. And I'll let others, you know, Umesh probably or Shivani, you know, feel free to add to this. So what, one question for you folks, as you think about, right? Like as a tech entrepreneur, I've never hired any, you know, accounting person or even a firm, right? So all sound good. Everybody's website looks good. Everybody has a nice pitch. You know, what questions or, you know, how do I differentiate between two people? To your point, you know, maybe you don't want to just go for the, you know, somebody offers $10, but like what kinds of things should I be asking them to really uh, even say, you know, I'll go with this firm or the, that firm. I don't know if you have any thoughts there, uh, Shivani or uh, Amish. I'll say it's the experience. I think the people who have done it, uh, I think you should be looking at it. There are a lot of nuances. Uh, I'll just say at a high level, if you can push out your revenue, you should do that. It's easy to raise the money when you're in the R&D mode. Once you get into the revenue, you are looking at very different set of metrics that you need to walk the VC through in the growth. So you're looking at at that stage, a very different matrix. I've been in a company where we rushed to get the revenue. We built up the Mercedes, but it didn't have the features of the Toyota and enterprise customers wanted a Toyota and migration to the Mercedes and the revenue got pushed out and uh, raising the cash, even though the company had raised like 100 million was extremely difficult after that. And we had to, um, there was a lot of dilution which happened. So revenue rush should be the last think uh, that if you're going to raise the money, R&D mode always will help you raise the cash much more faster than the uh, revenue. Um, and within the revenue, it's not only the revenue, I think, depending on what kind of revenue it is, transactional revenue, SaaS revenue, et cetera, then you're looking at different uh, nuances. Uh, it may have royalties and the commissions. In a SaaS ones, commission is the number one thing. And I think if you don't have the in-house thing, uh, a lot of the companies have been there, uh, commission structures which salespeople have been able to get it as like, hey, if you got the two year booking done now, irrespective of the cash, I need my money now upfront, irrespective of when the money is coming in or 
when exactly you're recognizing the revenue. So you can be in a scenario where you're paid the money, somebody on the booking and you're not collected and you're doing a quarterly invoicing other things. So those are the kind of, lot of the things which not only the from a RevRec rules, you need to be uh, very uh, articulate, have the policy and the procedures, but then other associated one, uh, in a lot of cases, there's the royalties involved, the commissions are involved across the board that you need to worry about. Yeah, I was, uh, was going to say, once you start generating revenue, if you have a complex model of some sort, so if you're selling a lot of different things at the same time with like large upfront payments, or if you're in a completely different industry that nobody's ever seen before, you do want to talk to an experienced accountant on how to account for it because you're going into meetings with VCs and you've got revenue numbers, they're going to make sure that the numbers make sense from a gap perspective, a US accounting gap, um, rules perspective. And um, it'd be helpful to make sure that you know the revenue you're generating is actually going to be counted as revenue. So if you are in those one-off situations, highly recommend talking to an accountant. Now, as far as figuring out the right type of accountant or the resources to use, I would definitely leverage uh, references. Don't ever be afraid to ask the person or the firm for references. They should be able to um, introduce you to people. And you can also gauge by the type of people they're introducing you to. If they're people that are similar sized and the type of companies that you are similar to, because uh, the risk you always run is they'll tell you stuff that's really great about themselves, but they might not be best fit for your size or your style of company. So references are helpful. Um, most board members usually have connections at all of the firms or other locations as well. So it's also helpful to get feedback from your board members or even your law firms too. They tend to have good recommendations as well. Yeah, if I could just build on top, I was go, go, when you talked of references, there's references where the company can provide, but I think it's just networking in the community as well. That's where like the things like Thai are important, but you find somebody and say, hey, you know, who have you worked with? What are the two or three firms? Uh, I think that's very, very helpful, frankly, because, you know, then you get sort of impartial or, you know, advice or somebody who's worked with somebody and, you know, all that kind of fun stuff. So I would, you know, definitely network within, you know, the Thai community or in general, your other entrepreneurs that, you know, you have um, uh, that, that you may know of or other people may know of and, you know, get their recommendations, uh, you know, from that. One other point I would make is I think there is when you start getting revenue, there is the accounting aspect of it, which I think you need to kind of think about how this is going to rec get recognized, et cetera. But there's the cash element to Amar's point. Cash is always king. And so even though, you know, that you might be accounting it as on a monthly or whatever uh, revenue basis, you know, if you can ask for, you know, a year upfront or, uh, you know, a year contract and give that discount or whatever to the, you know, to the customer, uh, then you're able to sort of, you know, go longer, maybe without needing to raise a lot of capital and, and you know, develop the company and higher valuation. So, Again, you know, sort of uh, don't be shy in, you know, asking for a, you know, one year upfront payment from your customers, uh, because for them, a little bit extra money may not, you know, be a big deal or cash flow upfront may not be a big deal, but for you, it might actually, uh, you know, come in handy. Um, but uh, Kamal, uh, I'm going to make one point here, right? So now I think we have started moving towards, you know, series A. So one of the things that I've always seen is, uh, Typically, when you sign, uh, if you look at the, uh, the deals, right, and, and the standard docs, in the standard docs, they will throw in usually saying, hey, we need audited financials or reviewed financials within 120 days of the year end, right? Please go back to your uh, uh, funders and, you know, talk to them. There is, these are standard items in there. If you don't have to spend your $30,000 on audit, please do not spend it. It's, it's a waste that money can be used very well somewhere else. So just talk to you, 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 know, you know, your, your investors. For the most part, they'll waive it, right? So don't get into that. And, and again, you know, as you start raising bigger rounds, you'll need it, but push it back. And, I, and it's kind of detrimental to my own business, but that's what I'll recommend to everyone. Yeah, I 100% agree, even if it's detrimental to my business as well. <laughs> but yeah, even um, up through like, you see companies all the time, even through like series B or C, where they can get those um, audit requirements waived or at least deferred. So you don't have to do it during a, you know, a more condensed period of time. Yeah, we have never gotten the audit done before series D or E, not in fact, till series C, I'll say we were forced. And in fact, board never, at the end of the day, it's the VC's money. Uh, and they are pretty reasonable people. 
I, I think only normally when you get the venture debt uh, as a part of that, like between after CDs or something, the bankers require it. But you can again tell the bankers if the board requests it and we do it for the board, we'll share it with you. Otherwise, we'll share what we have shared with the board, which is a typical forecast, et cetera, and the bankers will waive it too. But normally, bankers are the first one to get to that requirement. VCs normally will not have that kind of a thing unless it's a private equity. But again, you can work with the private equity. Private equity normally forces that. But VCs, uh, I'm not coming across before series D that we have been forced to have the audit. The yeah, audit is not needed, but I think, you know, as um, many of you have made, if you have a good bookkeeper or a good accounting person, uh, you can pretty much, you know, even the board or, you know, experienced people can just look at your kind of presentation and financials and, and understand that you're running a reasonable shop, right? You're kind of, you know, managing it in the right fashion. If you have nothing, then obviously it'll raise some red flags. So having a, you know, a reasonable process and a reasonable person helping you on, on that uh, will go a long way. You don't have to do the formal audit. Yeah. Um, and if let's say you get an acquisition offer or something, having those uh, again, they can pretty quickly assess that your you know your books are kind of reasonable and, and uh, there's not big red flags. So I would definitely encourage you know some kind of expertise that you tap into doesn't need to be very expensive that you know kind of helps you in that process um, uh, till till kind of a later stage. And even even with P's, you know, as Omesh rightly pointed out, you just I mean first thing is you have to go and talk to them. And most of the times, yes, they, they agree it's not needed, right? It's worth a try. Worst come worst, what they'll say, okay, we need it. And then they then you say, who, who, who needs an audit? Can I get a lower service, like a review or compilation? And you get away with that too. So I would definitely ask, because whenever somebody comes to me for an audit, my first question is always, who needs it, right? And if I don't get a good answer, I said, please go back and talk. You probably don't need it. So uh, there you go. Save some, yourself some money. So, uh, um, and maybe, you know, this might be a good time to kind of talk about international. We've got a lot of, um, um, at least, you know, in my companies and, and in Silicon Valley, I think a lot of people have, you know, teams in India or Ukraine or some other parts of the world. Uh, is there any consideration you should think about, you know, even from an audit or finance perspective, how to structure it so that it's sort of clean and, and uh, et cetera, any experience or guidance you have? Uh, Shivani, you've seen kind of companies doing that or? Um... Yeah, I, I, I would say that two things. Definitely make sure if you are setting up um, significant activities in locations that you are establishing an entity in those locations and then um, check for your transfer pricing rules. So typically you've got to set up arrangements between like the US and whatever entity um, and you should have like a cost plus basis that you'd be accounting, um, creating the entity for tax purposes on. Um, those types of analyses are not super expensive. Law firms, accounting firms can all help you with them. Um, and once you get it set up, it's a lot easier to maintain. The worst case scenario is you don't have an appropriate arrangement in place or you're not appropriately um, paying taxes in the country and then you start getting um, additional penalties and interest on top and that's where um, it becomes painful to deal with in the long run. Yeah, I agree with that. I think. Um... And majority of time, you know, the, the third world countries, majority of them are much more regulated than the US. They, you have to get the audits done and do the filing. We have always used the outsourced service because again, the teams are small. It doesn't make sense to have the person in-house that uh, transfer pricing and uh, the setups are extremely important because when you're filing even the US taxes, et cetera, you need those kind of things. Uh, for India, if you have to file all that far and other things. Uh, but uh, at least in all the companies we manage, I outsource that function uh, uh, to the third parties and they did pretty reasonable at a very uh, economical price. Uh, definitely, I was involved myself in the transfer pricing because again, if you're involved and you look at that, it can make a big difference. Uh, uh, normally transfer pricing, depending on country to country can range from, you know, 10 to 25%. And you have to look at the companies where they're comparing your set of the companies because that can be a lot of cost on the US side if you're not careful and uh, uh, down the road, it becomes very difficult to explain why that number was there. So feel uh, definitely challenge that and work with whosoever is doing your transfer pricing. Just don't take it uh, that what they, they are the professional, they know what they're doing. Uh, because it's your company, you may have a unique uh, compactor. So it's e good to bring that out 
and so that they can compare with the right uh, competition. Otherwise, uh, you know, majority of time you're a small company and they're comparing you to a big company. Uh, nine out of the 10 times I've, I had to change the competitors and the segments they were pitching us and that changed the transfer pricing number drastically. So let me just take a step back for folks they may not understand. So, you know, um, from my experience, the typical structure, I'll talk about India, right? Typically what people do is you establish a subsidiary in India for let's say your development office or whatever. And the US entity has a agreement. They view the Indian subsidiary as a development house. And so whatever that cost is of the India operation, uh, when people are talking of transfer pricing here really is, what does the India subsidiary charge the parent? And most countries would require to add a, you know, effectively a margin or something extra to your cost uh, so that there is local tax owed effectively, uh, they're not getting free. And so to Omesh's point, whether it's 10% over your cost, 15, 20, uh, typically you have to do a study to say, you know, what are equivalent type of companies doing in this area? And so let's say your cost in, the, in India for doing that development is you know, $100,000 in the year, you would be billing the parent company in the US you know, 115,000 because you added 15% uh, you know, transfer pricing and you're you know, having $15,000 profit in, the, in, in India. Uh, and, and for that you potentially have you know, old taxes, et cetera. So that's the concept here, but it's I think very important to establish kind of the, uh, uh, the transfer pricing model and the IP ownership, especially. Uh, so that there's no confusion around who owns the IP uh, 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 or the intellectual property, uh, and then there is the sort of the accounting and the you know the uh, the transfer pricing, et cetera, financial aspect of that uh, that also needs to be thought through. And this is definitely something that you should you know engage some kind of expert, um, uh, you know, in, and there are many firms that you know help you do that. But it's quite important again, I think, as you scale the company up. So I just want right. to make that clear because some people may not understand, you know, may not understand. Uh, yep. uh, in fact, from very you know. Seasoned entrepreneurs, I've got this question recently. They're all looking for, you know, help around, you know, this sort of IP structuring and making sure they don't, you know, uh, do something wrong. Uh, so that in that area, I would definitely, you know, try to get some expertise and uh, establish it nicely if you're thinking of having a development. And I, I'm pretty sure, you know, most of us, you know, if you know what transfer pricing is, the next question that you get asked is, hey, what's the typical percentage should I use, right? I mean, that is the question I get all the time. And I said, well, obviously my answer is, well, there's no one per definitive percentage you should get a study done. But I typically tell them if, uh, and I said, I always say, don't quote me, but you know, uh, anywhere between 13 to 18% is at least where you start. And then, you know, if you're not done anything, start there and then make sure, do make sure that you get a, a, a study done, you know? So that, that's typically, you know, where, where I look at usually. Yes, in my experience, after the first couple of years, you have to get a study done, at least in India, right after two years or, or you know, for, for after about a year or so, uh, and uh, you'd be able to justify whatever that number is based on industry data. And uh, if you're an experienced guy like Oma, Omesh, you can maybe, you know, argue and find nuances to lower it, but uh, otherwise you have to trust whoever is doing that and maybe push a little bit. Uh, well, I think I there can... have been a lot of questions around valuation. So everybody obviously is quite uh, interested in how do companies get valued there are companies with no revenue suddenly are you know at a very high valuation what metrics people look at so again i don't think this is a science but anything you can share on uh, you know how people are valued you know how companies are valued pre-revenue post-revenue uh, from a vc perspective or uh, otherwise would be helpful so i don't know who has most maybe omesh you are kind of more on the uh, sure. <laughs> uh, all yeah. kinds of spectrum there but uh, whatever uh, you know guys yeah no i i think companies at that stage uh, uh, I, I think basically you start looking at the competitors. Uh, uh, I have at least for all my companies uh, which we manage, we looked at the pitch book, what the competitors are doing, looking at what the cap tables are, what kind of valuation they came in, uh, looking at potential TAMs in that area. So those have been the more of the dominant uh, factors. Uh, then there are other factors like, uh, you know, who are, your other founders and other things, if they have any track record from a VC perspective or they have no track record. So I think those are the two factors from a VC perspective, competition and the team, which uh, determines to a great extent the valuations of the earlier rounds, uh, which is the pre-revenue. Uh, and and uh, I think uh, there's no rocket science over there. Um, it's a more of uh, you know trying to convince and trying to do it because uh, at that stage, I'm saying looking at 
you know, you can say, okay, we can do the net present values or discounted cash flows. But question is, you have pre-revenue three years out, who knows what exactly is going to be the forecast that you're going to come through. Um, so those models, you can do it, but I'll say uh, very difficult to support the uh, outlooks uh, beyond one year. Anything beyond one year, I just discounted by 50%. Anything, whatever anybody says, or even more after that. So it's a predominantly, I'll say, the team, uh, the market, and the competitors, and what valuation they have uh, been able to get. And I do majority of my research on the crunch base or the pitch book. Uh, that's what uh, I have used. Anything you want to add, Amar or Shivani? To... No, yeah, I mean, I, I second, I think, what Omesh said. I think uh, uh, early stages, uh, the quality and the prior experience of the team, I think is very important because at the end of the day, you're investing more in the people, right? I yeah. mean, yes, there's technology and there's dis disruptive potential and everything, but the team, you have to be sure that you're uh, investing in the right team. So I have always seen uh, whenever deals happen, uh, I mean, I'll talk briefly on our, our deal, right? Which happened last, last uh, week, right? And what did the PE firm see in us? You know, it's, it's the people, right? And we are, we are in, in the people business. That's a different issue completely. But still, I mean, why, why do we go with Eisner versus XYZ? I mean, because the records may be, but also the people. So that's very critical. And then you can use different, there's seven, eight different valuation models, which you can go into. But I mean, at pre-revenue stage, that's hard. Yes, at, at, at the later stages, you can start applying DCFs. And you know, if you are cash generating or if you do an AV or a, you know, book value or whatever you can. Uh, but very critical, I think, point uh, was made, you know, uh, look at your people, look at the disruptive potential and just, you know, go ahead with that. Yeah, I think depending on the type of business too, um, if you're pre-revenue, but you're building like some type of platform, so user counts also help. So even if they're not paying customers, but people that are hitting your website on a regular basis, that type of information is also pretty important in the valuation models too, to see how big your reach is. Yeah, but I think pre-revenue to a lot of your points, right? I think it's a very subjective thing. It's really right. about how strong your negotiating power is, uh, you know, what other people are excited, you know, what options do you have? Do you need to raise money or not? Are you desperate? And the other parties can sense that. So it's really about, you know, kind of your position. Um, uh, and are you being fair? So, you know, I, I also, you know, as I've raised money, I want to make sure sometimes people get excited about very high valuations, but if you take that high valuation, the next stage of you know raising capital may become more challenging if you you know haven't met the next set of metrics so you want to balance that out you want to give some upside to your existing investors you want to be fair to your founders and employees um, but not in my opinion uh, again you know not get overly greedy sometimes you see a lot of you know high valuations but then later on you have down rounds etc so i think it's very very subjective at the early stage and 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 you know raising money on just promise becomes easier uh, but once you have real revenue, then there are obviously comps on multiples on all kinds of things, especially as you you know raise higher revenue, uh, have higher revenue. So then it becomes more of a science of looking at in you know, the market uh, comparables and things like that. Um, th uh, um, there are some sorry. questions. Sorry, go ahead. One quick question, actually, for Amation. Come on, um, a lot of my clients they tend to ask me early on, like, how much should you ask for when you're going into these discussions? Like, should you ask for more than what you need, or should you? ask for the bare minimum? Um, like, how do you typically think about that when you're going into meetings with uh, VPs or PE firms in raising funding? Is the question that, you know, should you, you know, from a uh, actual capital raise, should you ask for more than you need or what, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I don't know what, Omar, you know, you've raised more capital probably, Omesh, and, you know, advise CEOs. Yeah, and... so I'll say, uh... We normally, uh, I agree with the Kamal's point, we try not to raise the cash upfront that much. Uh, normally, I think we like to keep it limited because the two things are there. First of all, you know, if you take the, uh, you know, the kind of thumb rules, people like to raise in series A 15 to 20% uh, dilution. Uh, sometimes the VCs will look for 20 to 25% of your cap table in series A. Uh, and if you can manage to 15 to 20, uh, that's better because in the next round, if you look at series B, your valuation has gone up and you're giving up 20. 
I've been in companies in a scenario where CDCs, uh, they're like 76, 77% dilution. Uh, the monetization models are not clear. And then they have to go to series D and E. In the end, the company may look very well, but believe me, in a lot of execs, the founders have got hardly anything. It's the VCs which made the money in those things. So I think uh, you should look at the thumb rules. I like to keep uh, series A, uh, to around below 20%, somewhere 15 to 20, and, and try to limit it on that uh, so that if you need to do a dilution, deliver it, and then raise the valuation. I, I think that's a better model, but if you take the money up front and you're giving up 25% or something, then Kamal is right, then you have to deliver on more of the things, and that becomes a challenge because you're defining the product, uh, the product keeps on changing during the initial phases, uh, I don't think uh, I have been to any company where the thought of a product and its states from a seed down to series B, nothing changed there. A lot of the drastic changes happen as you adapt. Yeah, I think this ownership point, I think, Amish, that you made is very important because from a VC perspective or from a you know financing perspective, people want certain amount of ownership right, of the company for it to be meaningful because if you look at it from a VC perspective, their constraint is time. Right. Money sometimes is not the constraint, but they're going to invest or work with, you know, X number of companies. And if they don't have meaningful ownership. Right. And so the, everybody in the back of their mind has, OK, Series A, I want to have 20 percent ownership or 15 percent or 25 percent. And so you have to think of that and be reasonable around kind of your expectations and maybe match the amount of money you're raising. So maybe you raise more money and give them the 20 percent they're looking for rather than, you know, that nobody's going to do the 10% deal and you know less money may not be interesting to them. So I think there's a bunch of dynamics there that you have to think about, but uh, you know, frankly, it's uh, you know, more uh, uh, subjective there. Um, there are some uh, technical questions, which actually I don't know uh, answers to, but some people are posting on the thing. Uh, there is something called round tripping uh, of shares, round tripping across broader offices, somebody is asking. So I'm not particularly familiar with that. Somebody can comment. I don't know what round tripping of shares across... Uh, um, border. The question says, what is term of giving shares round tripping for cross-border offices, US and India? Heard this term round tripping, what does it mean? How to avoid it? Anybody has any comment? I, I don't know what exactly round tripping, but uh, I think if you're looking for options uh, to be given to the India employees and options given to the US employees, both are governed by the tax rules and, and the option paperwork are different for both the countries. You should not use the US option paperwork for India. And, and the people who have done it in the past were hit with a lot of the tax bills. So that's one area, definitely count on the experts to get the right uh, kind of the option paperwork. And uh, because normally 90% of the option paperwork is same with the exception of the tax, uh, which in any option paper, you always have that. Uh, so I don't know uh, in drone tripping nowadays, I've not seen that. I've seen the India people getting pretty much the India options uh, or any other thing, and the US pretty much sticking to that. Can be same option plan, but as I said, the only nuance is the tax. Okay. Um, let me browse other questions if there's anything that. Uh, um... Okay, then there are some specific questions around equity split between founders. I don't know if there's any standard answer. You know, those are all to be negotiated based on, you know, what people are bringing to the table and et cetera. So I don't, uh, there's no formula there. I think that people can work with. Uh, I would, you know, again, re-emphasize one point on the tools that at some point you want to document all this, you know, share ownership and some kind of tool. And again, there are uh, reasonably low cost options available um, uh, because those become, you uh, important if you raise any kind of financing later on or of exit. Uh, earlier, we used to all manage that in Excel, but that becomes more and more complex as you, uh, you know, start managing vesting yeah, schedules. Yeah, and yeah document it. And if somebody wants to challenge it, then they have to refute your documentation and come up with, with a good reasoning, right? But if you don't have it documented, you, it's, it's easy. They're saying, well, you just don't even have it. So just, just go ahead and document, you know, keep records always helps. Yeah, I think the same person who asked the round trip is also saying, is there one global pool through right off, you know, from options for subsidiary employees? Yeah, so I think in general, the company has one option pool. And then, you know, from there you assign to, you know, US employees, international employees, uh, you know, consultants, whatever, you know, whoever is. And from that same, 
you know, pool of shares, you're giving some preferred shares to the investors. So ultimately it's kind of the same pool of shares. Uh, yeah, a lot of times uh, I think, I, I don't know whether the person is asking that question, but that's a typical VC practice. A lot of times people just give more equities uh, to the subsidiaries and ultimately subsidiaries can buy the US shares. And those are the like tax planning tools that uh, do it. Uh, but in a typical VC uh, back companies, uh, subsidiaries are pretty much 100% owned uh, with a local tax uh, having one share. Um, so you normally don't do that, but uh, I have seen the companies where they played the game. Uh, it's not, it cannot be played too often, but they do play the game of, uh, you know, subsidy buying the US shares or dividends going back and forth on that to avoid the taxes. So um, you have to be really expert in doing it. People do it, but normally that's not the, really a model in the VC backed companies. And that that also sort of becomes a round trip. round tripping in my mind always comes when you know, some you know be, between the parent and uh, sub you know you're selling the assets and take right. getting it back. To to me that's what round tripping mean, means you know. Yeah. And and that for the most part if you don't do it right exactly it becomes illegal I guess. Correct. And that's why I said in a VC back yeah. that doesn't happen. But a lot of time in order to avoid the taxes people do that. But uh, I, I will not suggest. And if you have to do it, as Amar said, engage a professional. That yeah, that's where the thirty thousand dollars will go then. So, uh, but uh, uh, I think the plan was to have a separate sort of breakout session for any sort of one-on-one. -on -one, so we'll break that out. But before that, um, let me just summarize. Firstly, thank uh, our panelists. You know, Amar, Ramesh, Shivani. You know, thank you for your time and experience. If I were to summarize it from an entrepreneur's perspective, I think the main points people were making was at an early stage you can keep processes simple, but do you know do think about it. Uh, documented uh, documentation is important. Uh, you don't need to hire people specifically for finance and accounting function. You can you know outsource it or find consultants. Uh, even till a very you know reasonable stage of the company, you can I think uh, you know uh, work with those folks. Um, but uh, think about if you're establishing subsidiaries outside. Think about you know the uh, again the documentation, IP ownership, uh, transfer pricing topics like that. You know engage some expertise there. And then the final point around tools was, I think there are very low cost tools available today that are fairly easy to use. Uh, so do invest in that. Don't be sort of uh, penny, penny wise, pound foolish, uh, you know, spend the $1,500, focus on the product, uh, make sure that you, you know, leverage those tools. So Frank, I've been very impressed today, you know, uh, in the last round that I did, you know, a lot of tools, they all interoperated each other through APIs. So if you have a bank that interacts with QuickBooks through APIs, all this stuff gets done automatically. Uh, these days, if you set it up right, so it becomes a fairly easy process, uh, but you need to understand what those tools are and reach out to your fellow entrepreneurs or to the Thai community or networking just to get the names of those tools from anybody. So with that, uh, Vrushali, I think the plan was to split this into a couple of uh, separate groups uh, with smaller number. Of yes. Groups. Open it up yeah. for a global discussion and not just on the chat. Yeah. So are you going to do that, uh, Vishali? Or? Yeah, I'll start the breakout rooms now, okay? Uh, you can feel free to move around the breakout rooms with the participants. Each breakout room is named by the name of a panelist. So you can choose to move, move between the breakout rooms based on a set of questions and the expertise of panelists. So we'll open the breakout rooms now. So you're going to have three breakout rooms, basically? Yes, okay. we'll have three breakout rooms. Yes. Thanks. And thanks again, Omesh, Shivani, Amar. Okay. So those who are here, they could just accept the invite and they can move to the breakout room. So David, you must have received a notification. You just need to accept it, and that's how you can move to a breakout room.
Thank you, ma'am. Hey, everybody. So, plan would be to come back or what? Recording.